Hi, everybody. Welcome to a re-recording of Lecture One for Intro to Backend Development, uh, where we talked about routes. I did try to record this lecture um, on Monday as well, but I don't think it's saved properly on my phone. So uh, I'll just be briefly going over some of the lecture content again. How uh, so everybody can be on the same page uh, when you start your assignment for next week. So yeah, um, like we talked about Monday, uh, just starting off with some logistics for the class. Um, you can enroll in this class, CS 1998, section 603 for two credits. Make sure to pass the pretest and fill out the Google form. You can find all of this important information on our course textbook. Then you can enroll directly on Student Center using the course number 11932. On uh, the course textbook, you can also find our ed discussion uh, as well as a helpful Google Calendar to track all of the due dates um, for the assignments and some other important dates for like the hack challenge throughout the semester. If you have any questions, you can feel free to email courses at cornellappdev.com. Uh, we'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. The structure for our course um, is pretty much like a traditional Cornell night class. We'll have lectures every Monday, Wednesday from 7.30 to 8.20 in Olin 165. We'll try to record all of the lectures uh, and post them on our YouTube channel once we're done. On Monday, we'll go over the actual content that you'll need, um, the conceptual content to understand for the week to help with your programming assignment. And we'll try to start the actual programming demo. Um, and then on Wednesday, we'll actually complete the demo. And after the end of every lecture, we'll be taking attendance by having a Kahoot um, to not only help you review the material, but also yeah, to track your attendance at the lecture. And again, recordings of our lectures will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. So in regards to our assignments, we have uh, weekly assignments. We have six of them in total, um, and they'll be released the Wednesday after lecture. You can get started on an upcoming assignment early as well. You can find all the assignments posted in our course textbook. They'll be due the following Wednesday at 11.59 p.m., with the very exception of this first assignment, which will be due on Friday. There'll be total six total slip days for you to use throughout your semester. So be sure to use them wise, wisely. And our late submission deadline is Saturday at 11.59 p.m. If you submit your assignment after the late deadline, there'll be a minus one penalty for every day that you turn it in late after the late deadline. The grading is pretty straightforward. Um, each of your assignments will be worth 10%. Your final project will be worth 30%. And filling out weekly surveys as well as attendance um, can be 5% each to count towards your total grade of 100%. And all you need to pass this class is a 70%. We do really strongly encourage you to attend our lectures on Monday and Wednesday. But if something comes up, um, definitely don't worry about it. Uh, don't stress missing one or two classes. But participating in the Kahoot um, and coming to lecture is definitely not only helpful for learning the content and retaining the content, but if you do well in the Kahoot, you can also earn very cool prizes. You can find our textbook um, here at uh, backendcourse.cornellappdev.com. It has a lot of useful information. I uh, will highly recommend you to bookmark it and check it very often. There's a syllabus on it, um, as well as all of the posted office hours that have been confirmed. We'll have office hours almost every single day of the week. So should you ever need any assignment help, um, feel free to come to office hours and we'll be happy to help you debug or anything like that. All of the assignment information is also on the course textbook. So you can not only review the content, for what is that assignment is going to be on, but also see the API specs um, and like the starter code for those assignments too. A quick disclaimer on academic dishonesty, we are a registered and official Cornell course. So we do expect you to follow Cornell's academic integrity guidelines. Make sure to cite anything that you use if it's not yours um, and you can definitely collaborate, but please don't copy code. It'd be really bad if we found out that there was an AI violation, we'd have to drop you from the course. Our faculty advisor for this course is Professor Walker White. So if you take an 1110 with him, you probably know who he is. Here are all the topics that, again, we'll be learning about this semester. We'll start with uh, routes, databases, relational databases, and abstractions. These first four topics essentially go over how to actually build a functional backend app. Then at the end of the course, we'll talk about containerization as well as deployment. Those topics essentially tell you about how we can actually share our apps with other people and allow not just the builder to actually use the apps that we create. 
And at the end of the semester, you have your hack challenge, um, as well as some additional optional lectures like images and authorization. So yeah, if you came to class on Monday, um, you probably met myself and Mateo. Um, so yeah, I'm Joyce. Uh, I'm a junior. I study CS and Econ in the Arts and Sciences School. Um, this is my, currently my third semester on AppDev. Uh, and Mateo uh, studies uh, CS and ECE in the Engineering School. Um, he's a sophomore, and it's also his third semester on AppDev. So yeah, let's dive into the content. So we first talked about the client server model on Monday, which is essentially the model that describes to you um, how an app works. So a client is any computer that runs code locally and interacts with the front end of an application. Essentially, it's the part that kind of displays content and handle any user interactions um, with an app, for example, um, clicking a button on the front end. So if the client is the computer that essentially runs the front end code, the server then logically it makes sense that the server is a computer that runs the backend code. The server runs the backend code and handles a lot of the data of the application. It centralizes access to information, which is very important. For example, if you're on YouTube and you want to look up cat videos, right? You wouldn't want videos about other animals like dogs or horses showing up. You would really only want them to filter down to what's relevant to you. In that, kind, in that case, it would be videos about cats. So essentially we have some server to do information processing for us such that we can actually get the information that we want from um, whatever application that we're using and not just all of the possible data that has been stored in the backend. The server also communicates with the clients. Um, essentially in our YouTube example, it brings that video back to us if we're looking for it. So yeah, um, here's like a visualization of the client and the server. Note that the client essentially communicates with the server and the server communicates back to the client, which, which is what we're gonna talk about now. So here we have a URL, uh, google.com, and we can break it down into its respective components to understand a little more about what each component does um, and how it operates. The HTTP part of the URL is the hypertext transfer protocol. It's essentially a protocol for defining how messages and data are going to be formatted and transmitted. There are other types of protocols as well um, to kind of regulate the, uh, to, to regulate like formatting and transmitting messages. But the HTTP sort of category is the one we're going to be focusing on for the majority of this course. Um, and it's very widely spread as I'm sure with any URL you've seen on the internet, you've probably seen HTTP kind of appended in front of it. So google.com um, is the name of the domain. Note that the domain is not exactly the server. Domain names um, are just an alias for the server itself. First, we would need to translate the domain name into an IP address before we can actually you know, identify which server it actually belongs to. So here's a visual representation on how we would access google.com. For example, the computer on the top left corner, that'd be our client. Our client wants to access google.com, so it asks a DNS, which is a domain name service, where google.com is. No, as we talked about a little earlier, google.com is not the server itself, but rather the domain name that will point to a server once we know the IP address. The DNS then tells us what the IP address of Google is, and then our client can now actually find the server um, in order to communicate with Google's backend. So when our client, you know, tries to find that Google backend server um, and tries to like send it things, like how are these two computers going to communicate? Well, the client will be first sending a server a request, right? So it's essentially a network call over the internet. Um, we can kind of attribute a request by the URL used to indicate, indicate like the request destination. The request um, can also be associated with a method to indicate the operation purpose or essentially like what we, we as the client want the backend to do. With a request, we can also send some information with it. Maybe we want the backend to do something a little specific and we need to give it some information to process so they can give us back what exactly we want. That information will be contained within a request body. The request URL is essentially the destination as to where our request is going to go. Um, it essentially like 
asks the backend and tells the backend to do a specific thing for us. We call these things a lot of things when we develop. Um, this could be like an endpoint. Uh, well, most commonly, this is known as um, an endpoint. And then the endpoint is associated with a specific route path to hit. Essentially, an endpoint is associated with um, some different functions that might happen once that endpoint is hit or once that endpoint is called. Um, and those are the specific route paths. We can integrate also data into the URL. So earlier, we talked a little bit about how the front end can send information back through a request body, but that's not the only way that information can be passed into the back end. We can also send information through the URL itself when we ask the back end to do something. And these things are often taken as query parameters into the functions that we write into our back end. So there are four main types of requests that we'll be dealing with um, throughout the semester. And they fall under these uh, four different categories outlined by the acronym CRUD, which stands for Create, Retrieve, Update, and Delete. The actual uh, more specific names of these HTTP request methods is POST, GET, PUT, and DELETE. So a POST request is essentially a request to the backend that asks it to create something new. A GET request is a request to the backend that asks the backend to give us some kind of information, you know, information retrieval. A PUT request, which you won't really use in this course, um, as we'll use a POST request for editing and updating more often than a, po uh, than a PUT request, it's essentially asking the um, information in the backend to be updated. And a delete, as the name suggests, um, asks us to kind of delete something in our backend. The name for these types of methods um, and sort of like the API that it generally falls under is called REST API or RESTful API. Talking more a little bit about how we can actually send information into our backend, as mentioned before, we can send information in a request body. So what kind of formatting does this request body have? Generally, we have a couple of standardized formats that are pretty um, widely used, whether that be plain text, JSON, or HTML. In this course, you'll be mainly dealing with the JSON format, which is a way of formatting information that makes it look a lot like a Python dictionary. Often, these types of formats and these bodies contain information necessary for our desired operation. For example, if we're trying to log in to our app, our request body to the back might send in um, a username and a password. Or maybe we're trying to create an Instagram post. Our request body to the back end might contain, um, you know, like the description, the image that we're trying to upload, et cetera. Um, we know that like, why is like a request body useful, right? Because we can attach like a more different variety of data to our request um, and, and send it to the back end to actually help with processing our information and, and give the functionality that we want. Is there a difference between sending information through a request body and sending it through the URL? There is a slight one, right? Because we know that if we're trying to send information through a URL, obviously the type of information that we can send to the back end becomes a lot more limited. Here are a couple of example requests. So if we're sending a GET request to Google, maybe to retrieve some information for us, right? We send it to the Google domain. We The specific route that we want to hit in the back end is the search route, right? The search route such that we can find some information that we're looking for. And here, note that we're sending information in the URL, right? The Q equals query is the exact query that we want to send to the back end and what we want Google to kind of search for us. We could also potentially send a post request to Google, right? If we want to log in to our Google account, as mentioned a little earlier, we can send information through a JSON format with our username and our password to ask Google to verify this and log us into um, our account. This will be a post request because essentially we're asking Google, we're giving Google information and asking them to create something new. And in that case for us, it would be like the verification. Again, um, the format in which information is sent into the back is in a JSON format, and note that it looks very similar to a Python dictionary. So a response is something that the server sends back to the client, right? So something that the back end sends back to the front end. And we only get a response when a request is first sent. So it has to be triggered by a client request. Essentially, a response confirms 
whether our operation has been done or tells us about the status um, of our operation. So responses from the back end generally are associated with some kind of code to tell us what's going on at an abstract level. And the re response can also send information back to the front end in a body, just like how a request sent information from the front end to the back end in some kind of body. So here are a couple of response codes that will be pretty be useful for you in general backend development and in this course. Um, usually, again, the response code is sent accompanying the response body, and it tells us the status um, of our request, essentially. So you, some common ones that you might have seen is like 200 for OK. Or if you're browsing on the internet and you hit a site that isn't really working, you might have seen 404 not found. You might have also seen 500 internal server error. And now let's also go over a couple of sample responses, right? So when we were looking for that original query that we talked about with the get request, um, we might end up getting something like this back, right? This is the response that the Google backend might give us. So we might give a status code of 200 to tell us that everything is okay. Um, and then we actually found some query. And then we also might get back some information in a body, right? In this case, again, our data is formatted as a JSON. This JSON has two particular entries. We have the count and the result. The count may be for how many potential results we found back. And the results, as you see, is a list of dictionaries, so a list of like other data structures that tells us all the results that we got that matched our original query. For our post request that we talked about earlier was about authenticating and logging into our Google account. Assuming that everything went okay, Again, we get a status code of 200, and we get a body with some information telling us about you know, useful information, maybe about what happened with our request. Here we have another JSON file with a field called success um, that is now true. So we've successfully logged into our account, and maybe some other data that could be helpful to tell us about what was going on. Assuming that we didn't actually log in properly, we get a different response code 401 instead. And we see that um, our success field is actually false now because we were unsuccessfully, uh, we couldn't we couldn't actually log into our account. And this time, instead of having some data as the second field in our body, we have an error, which might tell us what went wrong during the process. So yeah, as a quick summary of what we went over today, we went over the client server model, which essentially is the basic model for an, any app. We have a client um, that runs front end code and a server that runs back end code. They communicate with each other um, to help the app function. The client sends the server a request um, that triggers a route in the back end, which does then does some business logic, does some operations. Um, and then the server will send something back to the front end after all of that business logic has been computed. And that's going to be our return response. So then the client sends, or the server, sorry, sends a response to our client um, and gives us back some kind of information or tells us that something has been completed. So yeah, um, if you have any questions about this, uh, feel free to email the Cornell App Dev courses email, or feel free to post on our Ed discussion or our Discord, um, and we'll try to get back to it as soon as possible. At the end of Monday's lecture, we also went over some basic terminal commands um, that was also reviewed in the Wednesday lecture. So if you have any questions regarding those, feel free to check out the video that Matteo recorded for the Wednesday demo lecture, which will also, which again also contains uh, some of the information about some pretty useful terminal commands that might, you might use throughout the course, and also just a basic demonstration of how to get your backend app up and running. Yeah, um, so yeah, that's gonna be it for this re-recording. So uh, thank you all for watching and hope to see you next week in lecture.